Welcome to episode 36 of Lizzie's Bedtime Stories. I have a returning person. I can't say returning author because she was a co-host on Lindsay K. Silva's episode. So I am welcoming you back to my show, but now as a reader, welcome to the show, Beth. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. Beth Burnett on Lizzie's Bedtime Stories. Woo! <laughs> So you have some recording history. You were on a radio show? Well, um, no, I'm actually, besides doing you and Linda um, recently. You have I, never done me and Linda and just <laughs> just shut your potty mouth. Doing the reading or the recording with you and Linda. Um, <laughs> when I lived in the Caribbean, I owned a used bookstore and I did my own radio commercials. I wrote and recorded my own radio commercials and that's the extent of my broadcasting history. <laughs> <laughs> There's just always something salacious, which is ironic because neither of you are erotica authors, yet we, we, we keep on finding the two of you in bed together. Right. And yet, yes, no erotica. I, in fact, the story I'll be reading tonight, I tried to make an erotica just for you, and I, I, it still it just didn't happen. It, it's okay. I'll try not to think about how I ruined your ladywood. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and just, just not take it personal. Please do. <laughs> It happens to everyone. It's not a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> Liar! Um, okay, so you're going to be doing a reading for us. Can you set it up, please? I am. I'm writing. I'm going to be reading a story called The Law of Attraction. And this is, um, it's a kind of sort of love story. And as I said, I actually started off with the intention of trying to write an erotic story. But as my narrator and her, her love interest developed, it, it did not come out that way. So um, it's, it's just a kind of sort of love story, and I think the rest of it will sort of speak for itself as I read it. Okay. Suck it to me, Beth. All right. The Law of Attraction. I felt her before I saw her. Is that trite? All love stories seem to start that way. Our eyes met across a crowded room and bam. But no, it wasn't really like that. I met her at a spirituality retreat. I was feeling depressed and my friend had insisted that a weekend spent immersed in meditation, chanting, drum circles, and bonfires would be good for my soul. It was the middle of winter, so I couldn't possibly see how something touted as camping would be good for anything except a case of hypothermia. Still... I trusted my friend, and I was damn near desperate at that point. The advertised cozy cabins with ensuite fireplaces cemented the deal. When I met Lacey, she was standing near the fire pit, and she offered me a joint first and then a shot of whiskey. Looking around the crowd surreptitiously, I turned down the pot. I mean, some of these women were churchgoers, and though I imagine just the act of being at a spirituality retreat meant that they were more open-minded than most middle-aged housewives. I didn't want to take a chance on being arrested. I accepted the booze, though. It was cold, and though I know that alcohol only offers the illusion of heat in the winter, I wanted the illusion. I could feel the booze chasing down my throat into my chest, so I told her I would reconsider on the joint if we went somewhere else. She walked me back into the woods, placing her hand on the small of my back to guide me over tree stumps and rocks. She had a protective nature about her, and I felt somehow that if I were to leave her presence, she would probably straighten my coat and wipe the dirt off my nose. I was hyper aware of her hand on my back, even through my several layers of clothing. It probably sounds hokey to say it, but I could feel a wave of energy in the form of heat moving from her hand through my spine. It spread throughout my whole body and chased away the winter chill. I considered and then discarded the theory that the warmth was the result of the booze. Lacey told me that she was there to teach a class on harnessing the law of attraction to create abundance in one's life. Like Neil Donald Walsh, I had joked. She smiled but didn't laugh. There was a lot of sadness in her eyes and I wanted to touch that vulnerability. We smoked pot and did a couple of shots. 
I told her I was there because I was afraid of everything. Everything, she asked. Yeah, everything. Everything scares me. I'm afraid of noises in the dark. I'm afraid to go to the store by myself. I'm afraid that someone's hiding behind the shower curtain. Yesterday, I was driving across a bridge, and I became sure that the entire thing was going to collapse. I was terrified. She nodded wisely, but didn't respond. I have all of these dreams in my head, I continued, but I never do any of them. I want to go skydiving, but I can barely make it to the post office. You came here. It's a step, she said. I checked her face for mockery, but she was smiling affectionately. She seemed to have this innate desire to protect me, if even from myself. I'm pretty sure it was that protectiveness and her radiance and wisdom that attracted me, not the fact that she is tall and muscular with natural curly black hair, beautiful blue eyes, a big easy smile, and strong hands. Anyway, I said, I think my goal for this retreat is to learn to not be afraid. That's a big goal. Maybe you should start something smaller, like admitting that you're afraid. I just did, I said. She nodded. You did to me. Maybe you should bring it up in group meditation tomorrow. Have that be the focus of your intention. I shrugged, maybe. She offered me the flask again, and I took another shot. I was starting to feel pretty drunk by this point, and I leaned back against a tree to steady myself. She put her arm over my shoulder, standing close enough for me to feel her breath. You know, you just have to put it out to the universe that you want something, and it will come to you. I grimaced. I don't think that's necessarily true. It is, she insisted. I'm living proof. I didn't really believe in anything about the law of attraction or energy work before I started living it. Fake it until you make it. Her enthusiasm lit up her whole face, and her, ver- her voice got louder as she spoke. There was no pretension in her speech. I know that at least she believed what she was saying. Figure out what you want, she continued. I know what I want right now, I said, tilting my head up. She reached around the back of my neck and pressed her mouth against mine. I opened my mouth and invited her tongue. She reacted by pulling me hard against her and sliding her tongue deep into my mouth. I wanted to tell her to slow down and kiss me the way that she would lick me, to start slowly, to give me just enough of her tongue to make me wet, to only slide enough in to make me want more, to let my lips part automatically in reaction to her explorations. But I couldn't talk because we were locked together. And then she stopped kissing me and my head was spinning so badly I couldn't speak. I wanted to ask her to take me back to my room and make love to me, but I didn't know how to say it. Instead, she walked me back to my room and left me there with a warm hug. Later, when I was stroking myself and imagining her fingers, exploring and searching for the right combination of pressure and release to take me over the edge, I thought of a million things I could have said to make her stay with me. Of course, I always have the right words after the situation. I saw her the next day, sitting outside of the rec center. She said, how did you sleep? I couldn't answer. Smiling at her, I just nodded. She took my smile as a response and went on. I slept like a baby, she said. I looked at her, trying to decide if she was as attractive in the daylight. It's quite one thing to make out with a tall, sexy woman in the dark after several shots of whiskey and some marijuana, but it was quite another to see her sitting outside in the snow in a gigantic parka and an ugly fake fur hat, drinking coffee out of a thermos. Yeah, she was still attractive. I tried to focus on what she was saying, but my mind was on her lips and her hands and the way she squinted at me in the sun, so I grinned at her and said goodbye. She called something after me as I stomped happily away through the snow, but I didn't hear what it was. It was later in the day, and she was giving her class, and I sat in the front row staring at her lustfully. She spent much of her time smiling at me with the kind of adoring affection you would reserve for a younger sister who was not particularly bright but awfully adorable. You're just so cute, she kept telling me. So cute. I worked on my storyboard in a workshop that went along with Lacey's class. 
Rose, another teacher, had magazines and beads and feathers and trinkets. And we were all meant to be making a collage of the things we wanted to do or be in life. Don't say that you want to live an abundant life, Lacey had told me earlier. Say that you are living an abundant life. I ran into her after the storyboard workshop and complained that mine wasn't as good as I had wanted it to be. She said that was because I don't believe I deserve the things that I want. She wanted me to sign up for the next weekend's retreat to continue my development. I don't know if I'm ready for that, I said. I don't think I'm as advanced as the rest of these women. You are exactly where you need to be, she replied. She was constantly doing that, like she was exonerating me from some kind of blame. She did it calmly, without fanfare. Her voice was smooth and confident and didn't leave room for argument. I felt at once absolved from my imaginary sins and chastised for being so hard on myself in the first place. We sat huddled together under a tree in the melting afternoon snow, drinking coffee and smoking pot. She told me that she was polygamous and that she didn't want to offer me something that wasn't hers to give. And I wanted to tell her that I believe it's all right to love a lot of people in life and that being in love with someone opens a person's heart to loving more and that making love to a friend is the most beautiful form of sharing. But I didn't know if I believed it or not. Staring at her, I thought about her pressing me up against the tree and lowering her mouth to mine again. I imagine arching my body against her, wrapping one of my legs around her and pulling her closer. I could feel her strong hand sliding up my ribcage towards my breasts, and my body shivered in anticipation. I blinked myself out of the fantasy, shaking my head. I had been gaping at her and thinking about sex while she was telling me about her involvement with the spirituality community and how she came to be a guide and a teacher. She thought I had potential. She believed I had the power to change my own life. I believed I was nothing but a lech. I spent the weekend following her every word. She guided me around my obstacles, both real and imagined. When I said something critical or rude about myself, she pointed her finger at me and said, don't you do that. You are worth so much more than that. Everything that came out of Lacey's mouth was truth with a capital T. I couldn't refute it. I couldn't disbelieve her. I was so grateful that everything she said to me or about me was designed to make me feel worthy and beautiful and loved. Because with her ability to witness truth, I would have believed her had she gone the other way too. She came to say goodbye as I was packing my car. She pressed something into my hand, a little owl made of pewter. I hugged her hard and she kissed me on the cheek. And I thought about turning my head and kissing her mouth to take that home with me. But I realized that all I really wanted was to take more of Lacey home with me. That I wanted pieces of her to store in my mental file, to pull out when I forgot that I was worthy and beautiful. I wanted to kiss her for the same reason that I wanted to make love with her. Not because I need to have sex, but because I wanted to eat that goodness, to make some of it a permanent part of me. I wanted to absorb some of her peace. I wanted something that would last beyond the high of the retreat when the real world started to sink in and I was no longer surrounded by spiritually advanced and peaceful women who were constantly showing me how capable I am. I wanted to take home her voice and her confidence and her strong hands. I didn't turn my head to kiss her. I didn't need one more piece of Lacey. I just hugged her hard one more time. Smiling, I touched her hand. Lacey, you watch. You're going to be amazed by what I do this year. She grinned. I'm already amazed. I slipped into my car without watching her walk away, and I knew I wasn't going to cry. I wasn't sad to be going. People move in and out of our lives for a reason. They teach us things and move on. The best people are the ones we love, not only while they are around us, but when they're gone as well. I believe in loving with all of my heart, but I don't believe in limiting love. My heart belongs to a dozen different women all over the world, but there's always room for one more. I knew I'd gotten everything from this retreat that I could get. I would carry it home and try to hold on to it as long as I could. I spent a few days answering the how was your vacation question with obligatory pat answers. 
I didn't have any desire to delve too deeply into the truth of any of my real-world acquaintances. I felt as if I had found kindred spirits in the form of 20 like-minded women at the retreat, and every interaction I had there was fraught with significance. Suddenly, every relationship I had in the real world seemed shallow and insignificant. Finally, I couldn't avoid it. I had a conversation with my best friend, the one who knows everything about me. She may be the only person in my life who doesn't necessarily share my spiritual beliefs, but is able to understand all of the deep places in my soul. I figured she would want the truth. We chatted for a few moments about the retreat, and I gave her the most honest answers that I could. Finally, she asked, did you meet anybody special? I put my hands in my pocket and looked away, thinking about it. Did I meet anybody special? It required a million words or none. I pulled Lacey's owl out of my pocket and looked at it for a moment, blinking back tears. Yeah, I said finally. I met somebody special. The end. <laughs> there is a little tap tap sound. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, it's cool because I was like that. That's and that and that's the end of my story. So you went to um, Michigan's Women's Festival. I did. Is this something that came to you after being there? Um, I think that this is part um, definitely came to me from being there, but I also I actually did attend a women's spirituality retreat and. When I was delving into this story, um, some of that came back to me, and um, and I think that's where a lot of that came from. I uh, I went to Mount Holyoke College, it's a women's college, and that that feeling of being in a place with all those those um, well, I mean, it's very hippie, like the stuff that you're talking about, and a lot of the professors that I had, especially in my women's studies classes. Uh, we did um, consciousness raising and, you know, being very intentional and, and, and thinking about the things that you say and that you do. And one class, um, she, our, our teacher told us to keep a book. And um, it, we were supposed to write in it every time we received um, a privilege or, was, or uh, were being observed. And this was about race. Uh, okay. So, for so it was like I walked into a store and the security card didn't look at me, <laughs> you know, or I picked right. some, yeah, those kind of things. So, like when you're talking, I'm like, I remember a lot of these these folks who probably um, who do these these types of retreats, you know, first started doing them in the '60s. And I was thinking, like, I can relate to that stuff. And then it made me think of GCLS and being surrounded by women who love lesbian fiction and write it and read it and, and, and love it. And so I was like, I can see so many different times where I've been at a special place and enjoy the company of others and then had the horrible task of going back to the real world. It's, um, I call it the re-entry blues, and they use that a lot for the Michigan Women's Music Festival, but also, I, I did suffer that from GCLS and also the Left Coast Lesbian Conference. Um, it's really, I think, hard to describe to women who have not experienced it the, the communion, and it doesn't even necessarily have to be new agey or, no. or consciousness raising, but, but just the communion of being around women who also want to be around other women and how special and I mean imagine you know at GCLS when we all have these round tables and we're having these beautiful brilliant intelligent conversations about literature and life and and everything and for most of us I don't think we have that on a regular basis in the real world no no I love it and it's why I'm going to figure out how to be at GCLS again in Portland this summer and you must make it happen. I know it, it's already it's already it's already in the mix. It's already being saved for and planned for and whatnot. But I wanna. I'm really happy that um, 
You shared your story because it reminded me of all those wonderful experiences in GC last war. I spent time with you and Linda and Chris and Shalene and Andy and um, RG and everybody else, wonderful people who were at, at, at the con. And it was just a wonderful experience. And so it's kind of like having a little bit of that moment having you on the show again. Oh, well, thank you. I'm really glad I could bring that to you. Those are some of the most uh, memorable moments in my life, uh, both Mishfest and and GCLS and and the Left Coast Lesbian Conference. It's just being surrounded, I think, by women who you get into these these groups and then you say, oh, you too? I never realized someone else thought that way. And then there's like, you know, a hundred people that think that way. And it's just really an incredible experience. I know, I know. It's 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 the sweet that we love to eat. Mm. Yes. Wonderful. Or if you're into sweet and sour or spicy or salty, you <laughs> or know savory. If, or savory. <laughs> All of those wonderful things. I'm so glad to have you on on the show, Beth, and definitely gonna snag you in for a review episode when when I can. I would love it. Thank you very much, Liz. It's been wonderful.